Hey guys, it's Sarah here from Guardian Connie Corsos. And I have a little bunny walking behind me. <laughs> um, this is a very important video to talk about because there's a lot of very different opinions on this subject. And you guys know me, I hit the books, I do the research, I talk to other breeders many of whom may or may not be comfortable sharing their opinion and I consolidate as much feedback as I can get to bring you guys as close to what the truth may be as possible. And there's always anomalies and everyone has their own experience which may be different than what the average is. So, you know, don't discount someone's reality. But I want to share with you guys what I have learned because as you guys may know, I was shocked and so sad to find out Logan can no longer be a part of our breeding program because he has hip dysplasia. Um, and even more shocking to me was his hips were above average for the breed. So it just kind of rocked my world and made me think, you know, what are we doing here? Um, what's happening? because hip dysplasia can be debilitating for dogs. So we're gonna get into this video, but first of all, this video has taken a lot of effort and time and vulnerability to put together. So if you guys could please help us out in return, give us a thumbs up on the video, comment, even if it's just a heart, hey, love it, whatever, it really helps our channel. And lastly, if you are interested in hip dysplasia, we are going to definitely be doing some more information on this topic. So definitely hit that subscribe button. And I'm not honestly a fan of notifications, so if you wanna hit the bell to never miss a video, go ahead. Um, but I find YouTube tells you anyways, <laughs> if you're a user of that. So just keeping it real. Um, but yeah, let's get right into this. First of all, what is hip dysplasia? It's a fancy word for a common medical condition that's typically experienced by large breed dogs. We do know it can actually happen to small breeds as well. It's just much more common in large breeds. And basically the simplest layman's terms that I can share with you on what it means is there is a, a socket and a ball joint in the hip and it should fit together and smoothly uh, work. Now, in a dog with hip dysplasia, it either doesn't fit or it's, you know, rubbing and causing pain. And ironically, I have something that's similar to the human form in my knee, patella femoral syndrome, you know, I won't get into all the details, but grinding, when you feel your bones grinding, it can cause pressure, it can hurt. Um, the worst I've had it, I've collapsed um, in pain. And even more ironically, by working out, doing different muscles, I've able, been able to uh, get that you know, joint back to where it's supposed to be. So from my own firsthand limited experience with knee issues, I can tell you that this can be extremely painful, but muscle also plays a very important role as you guys will see as we go along. So, you know, it's, if you talk to any owner like we've done, who's had a dog with severe hip dysplasia, you pretty much have them crying because it's, very painful, surgery success is not very high in all cases, and some dogs can, can barely even move. And you have this on large breed dogs, and you can't move 200 pounds of dead weight, even 100 pounds of dead weight around easily. So in many cases um, that are in a, in a severe hip dysplasia, um, they have to put the dogs down they are euthanized because they're not gonna have a positive quality of life. They're gonna constantly be in pain and that can lead to uh, 
to bigger issues. So this is a very sensitive topic. If you've ever been impacted by one of your dogs who has hip dysplasia, my heart goes out to you. My con you know, condolences if you've ever had to put a dog down. But it's a very serious discussion. Some of us are more financially blessed than others. Some people can not bat an eye, you know, if there's an $8,000 surgery to get your dog a hip replacement. Um, this is considered a genetic disease by the veterinary associations, um, by the animal medical professionals. Therefore, it's not likely to be covered um, in insurances if, if you don't have a good policy. And so that's why many, many breeders will cover debilitating hip dysplasia in their contracts because that basically means the dog is, is either going to be put down or is going to cost a fortune to, to repair, which most people um, cannot afford to do. So that's what hip dysplasia is. Now let's talk about what causes hip dysplasia. This is a very sensitive, passionate, political topic where I haven't found everyone to agree on it. Some breeders say it's not genetic, it's environmental. Other people say it's purely genetic. Um, I think it's both. To be honest, from my research, if I had to take an opinion, I do think that responsible breeding can lower the odds of your dog getting hip dysplasia, okay? I think the other big part that probably accounts for at least 50%, if not more, is what you are doing with your dog environmentally, okay? The strictest Cane Corso contracts I've seen, no stairs, um, no jumping in and out of vehicles, no running till the age of two, you name it. There are so many different things that you are responsible for as a puppy owner to help ensure your dog does not get hip dysplasia. Because guess what? Many, many dogs in this breed are susceptible to hip dysplasia and more than likely they are going to get it than not if you don't do things uh, to prevent it from happening environmentally. Weight is another thing that can cause it. Heavier uh, weights cause more pressure on the joints. Um, and lastly, nutrition. This is a huge, huge topic um, that I'm currently researching because I am going to have a follow-up video on, you know, so your dog is, you know, predisposed to get hip dysplasia. Now what do you do? Or my dog has arthritis. Now what? So we will be definitely doing a follow-up on what to do if you're dealing with this, but this is more generally about what the hip dysplasia is, how to read test results and how to avoid the situation. So nutrition, 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 you need to ensure that you're giving your dogs a healthy food. And from all the research that I've looked at, um, a very well balanced raw diet can actually uh, reduce inflammation and help ensure that your dog, even if they're predisposed to it, genetically does not get hip dysplasia. So those of you that are able to feed raw, awesome. Those of you that aren't, don't feel bad. There is like life, you know, some of us are lucky with time, others are not, just like money. If you are feeding a kibble, you wanna feed as high quality of a kibble as you can afford and you wanna feed supplements, okay? So uh, glucosamine chondritin is the biggest one um, that they recommend because that helps with the joints. Dog treats come with it. You can buy the supplements. Um, I'm looking into if you can use the human grade ones because often I find Naw Dog branded things are much cheaper. And uh, another supplement the vet shared with us is, is fish oil. It helps their joints stay 
um, well oiled and gives them the nutrients they need. So nutrition is a big factor. If you're not feeding your dog well, they are going to be more likely to get this. So genetics plays a role and environmental plays a role. If you're exercising your dog too much, they're overweight, um, they're not getting the you know minerals they need, they're going to suffer um, if they're predisposed to get hip dysplasia. How do you know if your dog has hip dysplasia? Well, basically, you're going to notice that they're not running uh, like they, they used to. They might be hopping around or, you know, compensating. They usually compensate in their shoulders um, for their back weight. Um, you'll notice some pain or discomfort, and it can be as bad as the inability to move. Um, your local vet should be able to check um, during their checkup for any inflammation or issues in the hip area, but the only way to truly diagnose it is with an x-ray um, because that shows them that there is an issue um, with the joints and the issue with the joints usually leads to arthritis, um, osteoarthritis, um, which can be uh, breaking down of the joints and the bones um, in the worst case scenario. So it's, it's serious stuff. In our video description below, I'm going to link um, a link to the AKC website, which shares a full list of symptoms and their information on hip dysplasia. So you guys can get it straight from the source if you are interested in more details. Everything I've researched and everyone I've talked to who I respect in the breeding community all say pen hip is better than OFA for hips. Pen hip only does hips, OFA does hips and elbows and is a little bit cheaper, okay? Now the confusing thing for us as consumers purchasing a puppy, pen hip and OFA have different ways and different scores of, you know, reading the hips. I personally think that if you can, you want to look for a breeder that does pen hip, okay? It really is the best practice in the breeding world. You're going to get some breeders that don't believe in it, um, and, and that's up to you to take that chance, but just know you better do everything in your power to ensure your environment is solid, you know, feeding raw or with supplements, not allowing your dog to do very much exercise in the first couple of years of its life while it's growing, you know, ensuring it's on soft surfaces, you name it. So there's a lot of stuff that is on your shoulders if you're not looking at health-tested parents. I learned the hard way, okay? I purchased both my dogs from excellent breeders um, in many ways who I trust and you know, still reach out to, and they help me out from time to time. A lot of experience in the breed. And uh, they just didn't believe in, in health testing. They both told me from their experience it doesn't say much. I don't know the answer to that, but you guys have questioned me and said, well, if you can do it, do it, because it will give you some factual information on your dog's hips. And luckily we did because Logan has arthritis in his hips, which I guess means he has hip dysplasia. Um, I'm not really 100% sure on that. So I'm going to talk today and focus on pen hip because that's what we did, that's what I know, and that's what I got the results in. Let me know in the comments, guys. Are you interested in the OFA results as well? Um, from what I see, they're a little bit more clear cut, like good, excellent things like that. But if you guys want me to do a video on OFA test results, I'm happy to do so as well. So just let me know in the comments. Um, but pen hip is basically uh, x-rays and they have one where they, you know, stretch your dog out and they have another one where they push the hips in a position to see how much laxity there is, which is basically looseness in the hip. Their belief is the tighter the hip, joint, the less chance the dog has 
of developing hip dysplasia. And PenHip claims that they can tell um, pretty accurately, let's say I think around 80%, um, that at 16 weeks old, what the chances are that that dog could be a bad breeding candidate for hip dysplasia. As a breeder, um, putting your dog under after you may have cropped their ears at such a young age, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Um, so keep that in mind. But as a breeder, if you're doing things right by the books, you're showing your dog, training them, you know, it adds up. It's very expensive, and in our case, we waited till over three years old only to find out, no, you know, we spent all this money, we did all this stuff, and now we have to cancel our program. So you wanna do it early enough before you make a massive breeding type investment in the dog, advertise it, you know, as a future litter because you're just setting yourself up, okay? So you have to go find a vet that is certified in pen hip and the testing is free. So anybody can do it. If you have a vet who's never heard of it, they can go to training, be certified in it. I would highly recommend finding someone that knows it and knows your breed, but it is, it took us, I think a good year to find somebody we were comfortable with that does it close enough to where we are. And, um, the, the dogs go under, so you really need to use uh, someone that you trust, and you've heard me say it before, but if you have a Connie Corso, they don't need the same amount of anesthesia as other breeds, so make sure your vet has operated on a Corso before, or if not, can call somebody to get some advice before you trust them to operate on your dog. So while they're under, they get stretched out, and they also get a device uh, put onto them that I haven't been able to see, um, but it's described as a distraction device from pen hip, and it basically puts pressure on the, the joint to really see its true elasticity. Um, so that's really the, the test. Um, you pick your dogs up, they're a bit groggy, and uh, they might have some digestion issues because they've had a tube in their throat, but other than that, that's the procedure. Um, your vet then has to submit the paperwork and you get it back within about 72 hours. So very, very quick. Um, and as you've heard me say in my other videos, if you follow this channel, very expensive. This procedure for us in our area where it is typically cheaper than other areas in the US, we're here in Georgia, it was uh, like they quote you about six to seven hundred, but it ended up being more. So, you know, it is not a cheap procedure. You're spending almost up to a thousand dollars in investing in a dog that you don't even know if it will have good enough results to breed. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, as you're gonna see in my results, if I had tested Logan at 16 weeks old, he would still be breeding, okay? So I'm gonna show you guys their test results, and then unfortunately, if you're still tuned in, I have a bit of a rant, because I think we need to do better as people buying puppies, and I think breeders need to do better. Because again, I truly in my heart feel we're making decisions out of money, and not out of what's possibly best for the dogs. All right, so let's get into the results. All right, so this is the results for Logan, and we'll show you his first. But basically you can see that his right hip has a distraction index of 0.53, and his left has one of 0 0.48, okay? They found radiographic evidence of mild osteoarthritis and moderate on the left, which interestingly enough, the left is 
<laughs> closer to the low wrist than the right hip. Okay, so you can see the average of the braid is within the moderate risk. And this gray line represents the 90th percentile. So 90% of Cane Corsos are within the mild to high risk. Some are definitely outliers in the high risk section, and some are outliers in the low risk section. When I saw this, my heart sunk for the breed, okay? So Logan is above the average, okay? And according to the pen hip, he should be bred. But because we health tested him so late, and the os osteoarthritis um, is showing, we have chosen to do the responsible thing and not take any risk just in case it is genetic in nature instead of environmental, okay? So you can see here <laughs> that there's only 2,691 Cane Corsos in the Penhib database. <laughs> not cool. Okay, so when you see a breeder that says our dog is in the 90th percentile, look at the results. They could be here. They could be here. They could be here. You need to know their um, distraction index number, okay? And ultimately, where they fall in the risk category. Ideally, we're looking for mild risk and low risk, but the average of the breed is, you know, within the moderate risk area, at least on the higher end. So that's not the end of the world. Um, so Logan is at moderate risk and he certainly developed it, okay? So that's basically what his report says. Phoenix's report here much better numbers. She has a 0.44, so her right is also let me see Logan's. Yeah, her right is less um, than her left. So her left is is uh, tighter than her right, just like Logan's. Um, I don't know if that's a trend or a pattern, but basically uh, she falls in the category of 0 0.44, and they also even say that dogs who have been bred um, can have looser hips than those that haven't been bred. So if your dog has been pregnant or has had puppies in the last few months, they're not even eligible to do the test. So I'm assuming Phoenix, uh, her genes are really, really good for helping improve the line because she's being tested so late, um, like Logan. And you can see it's the same information of patients, and this is likely to change uh, over time. So that's why saying 90th percentile means nothing. You need to ask the breeder for the results, just saying that they've health tested is not enough information, okay? So I hope this helps you guys uh, understand what pen hip is and what the testing entails. But there is absolutely no sign of any uh, osteoarthritis for Phoenix, so she is a great breed candidate if we can find a suitable stud for her. And you can see um, that she is in the, you know, I'm not sure what percentile she is, but she's definitely, uh, I would say around 70, 75% uh, of the top Connie Corsos tested. And now I'm gonna show you guys the best results that I've ever seen. Um, so let's take a look at them. All right, so this 
is some test results that were reported back. Um, and special thank you to Lyra and Tiernan's owners for letting us share these results on YouTube. Definitely um, give them a look up on Instagram and give them a follow. They're doing an awesome job with their Connie Corsos. Um, but you can see here that their results really are the best that I've ever seen. You may have seen better, and if so, definitely uh, share where you've seen them and what breeder. I'm very interested in collecting that information. But for many of you YouTubers um, that follow Senza Tempo Connie Corsos, this is actually, Lyra is a puppy out of Preacher and Cashmere. So I think the, the debate of all the haters is over. Rachel is actually producing some amazing puppies that are bettering the breed, at least in the hip area. So, you know, congratulations to her for producing this. You guys can see uh, the green line. Um, this dog, Lyra, is in the tightest 5% of the breed. Um, there is a minimal, minimal risk that this dog even potentially with poor environmental factors would ever develop hip dysplasia. So I'm hoping that they breed her. So definitely keep an eye out on this profile. They also have a beautiful, uh, gorgeous male from one of our other favorite breeders at Top Line, Connie Corsos. And, um, you know, I think it's very generous of them to share this information. So thanks again to Lyra and Tiernan's owners and for Rachel at Senza Tempo Connie Corsos for giving us the okay to share this as part of our video. So as you can see, it's just so shocking to me that Logan can be above average. He is considered a dog that would be breeding quality from Pen Hip because Pen Hip shares if anyone is above the average in the breed, they can and support their breeding. But because we tested Logan so late, we found arthritis. And that's likely caused potentially from, you know, a mix of his genetic predisposure and something that might have happened in, in our environment. Um, and just our lack of knowledge of, you know, giving him the supplements that he needs outside of giving him joint treats, which we always purchase. So I'm really not sure how he got it. Um, the only thing I know that we did, because we ensured he never had exercise, um, like running around other than his own uh, will. He, he's not a huge fan of walks, so we never took him on any major hikes. Um, the only thing we had was we had a lot of hardwood in our house, so I'm wondering if from slipping around, uh, it gave him some arthritis, but we always fed him a high quality kibble. Um, we never made him overwork on the stairs. Um, barely had him jumping in and out of cars and he was never overweight so we followed a lot of things we could have definitely given him more in supplements so again if you're interested in that that will be in our follow-up video but you know the only other thing that I can find environmentally is uh, we don't have a house with carpets and a lot of soft surfaces so that could be a contributing factor but what are we doing as a breed? Like, does it sit well with you guys? Let me know in the comments below that dogs above the average have arthritis. I don't know about you guys, but I think we can do better. And you saw that best, you know, practice um, review from a pup at a Senzo from a pup out of Senza Tempo Cane Corsos, that's what we should strive for. Um, and it's interesting, because I, I have to look up Preacher and Cashmere's health test results. If I find them, I'll put them in the comments below. But, you know, they produce 
you know, in speaking with Rachel, constant puppies with tight hips. So there's different things we need to learn as breeders on what combinations, like how did they produce that? That's amazing. You know, let's produce more of that, even if they may not have the look or the structure of the breed perf perfectly, you can breed that, you know, hip strength into the line. And one of the reasons Pen Hip recommends any dog over the average should breed as opposed to only dogs with no risk is it greatly minimizes the breeding pool because there are so many dogs with this issue. And then you get into line breeding and genetics and a mess. So please guys, if you see a breeder spending money to do pen hip, it's gonna cost you a little more for the dog, but it's going to save you money down the road. You are making a difference to this breed. If you truly care about Connie Corsos and you are now enlightened from watching this video, because many of us are ignorant and, and I'll be the first to admit that I was, but now you're not. You've seen this video. Do not buy any dogs that haven't come from health tested parents, okay? We are ruining breeds. We've ruined so many breeds in America and everyone's fear is that's gonna happen to the Cane Corso. And that's why I keep trying to stick it out and film more videos, but we need people buying these dogs to do what they need to do, do their research, find a reputable breeder, Find a breeder that does pen hip testing and ensures that their breeding stock are at least above average, hopefully better in the mild range. Um, but again, it's very uncommon to get a dog that's a better than the 90th percentile. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I hope you guys learned something from it. And I truly truly hope that with education and advocacy and people doing the right thing that we can ensure that this breed can be an example uh, and have their hip scores increase over time instead of degrade and get worse um, because that would just be heartbreaking because anyone that you know that has a Corso will tell you it's one of the best breeds that they've ever had so you know, I really want to make sure we don't ruin the breed. So, you know, again, it might be small ripples in the water, but we can make a difference to this breed by doing the right thing, saving up a little longer to get your Connie Corso pup. But we all need to make little differences. Thank you guys for watching and supporting our channel and stay blessed and stay safe. Thank you.